As autumn approached, Lewis and Clark were in a hurry. They knew the Rocky Mountains lay ahead, and they hoped to spend the winter there among the Mandan and Hidatsa. The Mandan and Hidatsa are two Native American tribes who had been friendly to Lewis and Clark. However, it was already so cold that the river was freezing into ice, and when the river froze, it was impossible to travel up the river in their boats. Where the Knife River flows into the Missouri, Lewis and Clark found five villages of Hidatsa and Mandan Native Americans. Like other Native Americans living on the plains, these people hunted bison, also known as buffalo, from horseback. They also lived in permanent earth lodges and farmed the land around their homes. This means they had shelters that they did not move, unlike nomads who moved their shelters with them. Four or five families shared each lodge, and even the horses spent bad weather days inside, in a roped-off space just inside the entrance. The Mandans especially welcomed the travelers from the east, because they were used to visitors. Other Native American tribes and trappers came to the Mandan area to share news and to buy and sell furs from beavers, bear, elk, or bison. Across the river from one of the Mandan villages, the explorers built a wooden house and surrounded it with log walls 18 feet high for protection. They made the high log walls to keep them safe. The men of the Corps of Discovery called their winter home Fort Mandan, named after the Mandan Native Americans. They dragged the pirogues onto the riverbank, but before they could move the keelboat, the river froze around it. It took three weeks to chop the keelboat out of the ice. When the river froze, it froze around the boat, and the keelboat became stuck in the ice. They had other worries, too. Lewis told Clark, We are eating so much food that we will run out before the winter is over, and in this terrible weather, it's getting harder to hunt. Thankfully, the Mondans arrived one day to tell them, we have found a herd of bison nearby. Come hunting with us. We have brought horses for you to ride. The result was more food and warm blankets made from bison hides. As the winter nights grew long and temperatures plunged or fell or dropped quickly to 30, even 40 degrees below zero, the explorers also traded with the Mondan for food. In return for all the food the Mondan gave them, Lewis and Clark acted as doctors for members of the tribe who were sick or injured, and several of the explorers who were skilled or talented as blacksmiths made iron tools, axes, and arrowheads for the Mondans. The party spent many cold nights asking the Hidatsas and Mondans about the country that lay ahead. Lewis and Clark kept all the information they learned in a journal. One day, a French-Canadian trader appeared at the gates of Fort Mondan. He announced, I am Toussaint Charbonneau. I heard about you from the Hidatsas. I am an excellent cook, and I speak English, French, and several Native American languages. I could cook for you and translate what is said in other languages into English. Lewis and Clark couldn't speak any Native American languages, so they needed people who could talk to them and also to the Native Americans they would meet. Also, one of their three tasks was to befriend Native Americans. Charbonneau had not come alone. With him was his very pregnant wife, a young Native American woman named Sacagawea. Sacagawea was a member of the Shoshone tribe who lived further along the Missouri River. The Shoshone were the next tribe that Lewis and Clark expected to meet. Lewis and Clark discussed Charbonneau's offer. Sacagawea could be helpful when we reach the lands of the Shoshone. She could show the Shoshone that we come as friends, and she knows a lot about the countryside there. Lewis and Clark thought that Sacagawea could be a guide and a translator for the expedition. As for Charbonneau, if he is the cook he claims to be, he will be a welcome addition to our party. Lewis told Charbonneau, We want you and your wife to join us, and of course we will pay you for your work. 
This turned out to be one of the best decisions the co-captains ever made. And while they had agreed to hire two new members of the expedition, they soon had three. One cold night, Sacagawea gave birth to a little boy. Charbonneau, the new father, looked proudly at his newborn son and said, We shall call you Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. William Clark laughed. That's an awfully big name for such a little fellow to carry. I'll call him Pompey. Pompey proved to be a good little traveler, too. Sacagawea's baby was nicknamed Pomp or Pompey. Lewis and Clark organized their notes and drawings and labeled samples of the plants and animals they had gathered. Remember, this was one of their three tasks requested by President Jefferson. When spring came, Clark announced, We have decided to split the party into two groups. We will send some of you back east to take President Jefferson the things we have collected and written. The rest of us will continue west. Remember, there were no telephones and no email yet, and there was no way to send mail in the Louisiana Territory. Lewis and Clark sent some of the Corps of Discovery to tell Jefferson of their progress and what they had found so far. On April 7, 1805, some of the party returned back east as planned. They carried with them four boxes and a trunk filled with plant and rock samples, as well as the captain's journals and drawings. They also took with them some living animals, such as a magpie and a prairie dog. A magpie is a black and white bird that makes a lot of noise. Lewis told Clark, I wish I could see President Jefferson's face when that magpie starts chattering away. The president will be mighty pleased, and he will be delighted with all the information in our journals and drawings. Clark replied, he will be even happier when you and I report to him in person that we have reached the Pacific. Then the two men started westward once more with the remaining men, one woman, Sacagawea, and a baby.